earlier this year, Adrian and I had the opportunity to, uh, toward the end of April, uh, head out to be able to see our children. Uh, I don't have a good reason for it, but our kids and grandchildren are all in Arizona. And so we went out. We don't get there very often. But there was something on my heart. My children know me, and they know my faith, and they know Adrian's faith. My grandchildren know me as Grandpa Rue. Ask me the story later. I'll tell you more about it. But that, that's the name that they call me by. But they don't know me in the sense of if you don't know my God and how he has impacted my life, you don't know me. And I had such a burden, not that I'm about to be taken off the face of the earth, but kids are growing up and they're, they're, they're developing their values and the direction that they're going to go. And the longer the time goes on, all of a sudden it's kind of a, a project of trying to bring people back to where they ought to be. And I desperately wanted my grandchildren to know what God had done. To know that this isn't just a business that I'm in, that I work at a church, some people work other places, but that I truly believe God has called me to be doing what I'm doing. I'm here because a gracious God picked me up from where I was. And he's been at work, interestingly enough, with the song, changing me. I'm still in process, but I remember a time when I was in the military over in Korea, and I said, God, I don't know what you can do with me, but if you could use me to help other people know you, here I am. And I put myself 100% in his hands. And I stand before you today, above you, because there's a platform, not because I'm better than anyone here, but because God in his graciousness said, I am willing even to use Bob Sheridan. And here I am. And I wanted my grandkids to know that. And I want you to hear this. If your kids, if your grandkids don't know what makes your heart beat, if they don't know the core of your faith, tell them. If it's a phone call you got to make this afternoon, face-to-face -face is always the best thing to do. But don't let it go unsaid. Don't say, I think they know. You make sure they know. You take the time to do that. I know that Oliver and Shelby didn't understand it in the depth that they will in, in future years, but they needed to know a little window into who their grandfather is. There's a role God wants us to have to impact our kids. It's not just see that they grow up and get a good job and get a good home and have a lot of money. If they don't have God at the core of their life, they are an accident waiting to happen. That was an amen moment. I'm telling you, you better agree with me and understand that. It. It's about God at the core, at the center, not somewhere in the life, but at the very center of our life. A couple passages we're going to go to here today. The first one is in the Old Testament, back in the book of Deuteronomy. There's five books in the Old Testament. First five, Ma excuse me, Matthew, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book from the beginning, um, if you're able to get there. Now, what was going on at this time was that the Jews had been in the wilderness for 39 years and 11 months. Those that started out of Egypt did not trust him, did not have faith. And because of that, they never were able to see the fulfillment of the promise that God had made, that he would take them out to a new land. So a new generation is about to go in. And this book of Deuteronomy, Second Law, is a reiteration of some things that had been taught earlier because this new group needed to know that, okay? So there's a lot of information that is in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. I I'm moving, if you would, to chapter 8 because a part of what it is 
that had been uh, talked about. And in fact, I guess it'd be in chapter 6, you'd first see it. But he said in chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He said, I thought Jesus said that. He did. But it was first given in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then it says this, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you rise up and when you lie down. Uh, you shall bind them as a sign before your hand. They shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them in the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I mean, wherever you are, you need to be teaching your children about me, about the Lord. That's a part of what was there. Chapter 8, we see this. Every commandment, this is being taught to the, the Jews, and I will say primarily to the parents with the idea of teaching their children. Every commandment, chapter 8, verse 1, Deuteronomy, which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way, all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, and listen to this, to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, some of you here have been with me for a number of years. You say, we've heard this verse before. Pastors shared this before, okay? And here we are. And if you remember that, then you're going to remember this. Pastor is about to say, how many here think God didn't know how they were going to respond, and that's why he did this? It's kind of an IQ test. Spiritual like you, you all did well, whether you're just afraid to put your hand up or whether you actually believe it. But here it is. How many of you recognize that God knows everything and the one who was learning whether they had a strong faith or not was actually the person involved? Can I see those hands? You with me? It, God knows. The problem is we think we're better than we are. I would... You know what, if I went through that trouble, that problem, that difficulty, I'd trust him all the way through. And then you hit the difficulty, and what happens? You go, oh my goodness, my backbone became jelly. What happened here in the midst of life? Because life is hard. Can I get an amen? Trusting God in the midst of the circumstances of life is what God wants us to do. If we never go through a trial... How do you know whether or not you're really trusting? Some of us here don't understand that. We go, hey, if you really love me, then you'd give me a smooth path and I'd never have any trials. No. If we never had to trust him, you ready for this? Some of us here in this room wouldn't. Now, you and I both know we're not talking about you. We're talking to the person next to you. We all understand this, you know. It's never you. It's never me that has a problem. It's those other people, you know. But here's what he says. Here's why I'm allowing you to go through those times of testing, the difficulties, the trial, so that you would get your eyes on me. Back to the text. He says, I'm allowing you to go through these things. I led you all this way to humble you to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his commandments or not. Verse 3, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know nor your fathers know. Y'all tracking with me? Because the latter part of this verse is key. That he might make you know man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What do we need? We need him. What do I need to know? I need to know what he says. Does that make sense? God allows us to go through the trials, but his desire is that through the trials, we would depend more deeply and richly on him. That's what it's all about, guys. It's about getting our eyes on him. In the midst of this, he says, Verse 4, and this is so powerful, the provisions of God we take for granted all too often. I have had people say, no, they don't really say this, but I could read their mind. Here's where they're coming from, saying, hey, God, if you're really there, where you been lately? How come you're not doing this for me and this for me and this for me? While what we need to be doing 
is recognizing the provisions of God. Has God been at work in your life? And the answer is, come on, overwhelmingly, over and over and over and over, you know? Listen to this, verse 4. Your garments did not wear out on you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart, as a man chastens his son, so the Lord chastens you. The word chasten means discipline. And I want you to hear this today. God loves us. There's a verse of Scripture, by the way, that most people come across whether they ever go into a church or not. Ever seen a football game? and somebody is looking to kick a field goal or an extra point, and somebody's holding up a sign, what's it say on it? You've been there, huh? John 3, 16, which says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. This is not an emotion. This is a fact. God loves you. How do I know he loves me? That he gave his son. Okay? So we don't say, does God love me? We know that God loves us because he's shown us through his son, Jesus Christ. But he continues to love us by at times disciplining us. I grew up in a home with a father who did not discipline. He punished. And he made sure it hurt. But it was not teaching me about how God works. Because hear me, parents, hear me, kids. Discipline is always out of love. It always has in, in its goal the development, the long-range positive aspect of a child. A child ends up tottering and moving right toward the oven. And, and you say, no. No. I said no. And then you have to go. And some people say, oh, that was cruel. That was heartless. No, that's because I love my child and I don't want them to touch something that could affect their lives. I have a fellow that I grew up with in my little neighborhood and you know what? He ended up doing that and getting to the stove and his mom was making, oh, come on, what's the morning? Uh, did I tell this before? It was oatmeal and he pulled it over on him. I remember in the summertime, us being out and doing things, scar tissue over the whole front of him from his neck area all the way down. That had to hurt awful and take a long time to heal. And it was a scar that he had for the rest of his life. You know what? When you love, you discipline. Do you understand that? Why? do we do what we do? And every father and every mother, every grandparent in this room has got to know, because I love them. Guess what? Somebody loves them and loves you more than you can understand, and it is my heavenly Father. So here's what I want you to get out of this passage. God is teaching us that he is, a, as a heavenly Father, chastens us or disciplines us. He did with the children of Israel because he loves them. Verse 5, again I read, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens, I'm going to use the word disciplines, his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. Verse 6, I'm just going to read now pretty quickly because I want to go to another passage. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water and fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper when you have eaten and are full. Then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Verse 11, beware. You do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments and statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full 
and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. I'm at verse 4, chapter 8. It says, when your heart is lifted up, you what? You forget the Lord your God. He goes on and he ends up saying about trials and difficulties that will go on and how God took care of them during the time in the wilderness. And he says, verse 16, who, this God, he fed you out in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know that he might humble you, he might test you to do good in the end. Verse 17, here's what I don't want to have happen, that you would say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gained me this wealth. You know what can happen? When you're not growing and focused and dependent on God, you start thinking you're pretty, pretty awesome stuff. I'm really great. You know, it's me. Everybody needs to realize how good I am. Look, do you realize what you could do without God's grace and God's mercy and God's hand on your life? Come on, we learn it in John chapter 15. What's he say? Verse 5, without me you can do. <coughs> we realize God is essential. They lost sight of that, and they went through a lot of consequences as a result. And I'm guessing some of us in this room have gone through some consequences. Don't amen me. Don't raise your hand. But it, you know what? It's life. We don't have it all together, and God disciplines us. But it's because he, tell me here, because he loves us. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12 right now. Hebrews chapter 12. By the way, just another passage that is out of Proverbs chapter 3 that I'm reading as you're going. He says in verse 11, My son, do not despise the chastening, disciplining of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. God loves us, therefore he disciplines us. I'm in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, and it says this in verse 1. Therefore, and I don't have time to get into the background of, the, of what was there, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. The word for looking is not a glance. It's a stare. Okay? The word for looking unto Jesus is not, you know, just glance at him. It is a focus on him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You probably heard that portion. I want to continue on. Why did the writer of the book of Hebrews say this? You learn in the next verse. Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Do you know what happens when we go through problems? We begin saying, woe is me. Everybody here, I want you to know what I'm going through. I want to have a pity party, and I want to invite all of you to be able to come because I want you all to be able to be there with me and tell me how sad and how hard it is of what I'm having to go through in the midst of my life. You all get me? You understand what I'm saying? That was happening. And the author of this specific text is saying, Hey, have you died yet? Get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes back on him. You with me? Because our Heavenly Father loves us. And He allows trials to come into our life at times to draw us closer to Him. Because He's got things that He wants to do because He loves us. In the text, continue on. He ends up saying this. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as to sons. And He's quoting now. Book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening or the disciplining of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens or disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. So essentially what it's saying is back in the Old Testament, that's the same way God's working in the New Testament. He loves you like a father, 
and he has a goal for your life, and he's interested in your long-term development, ju not just that you feel good today. He loves you, and he has your best in mind. If you endure, verse 7 says, chastening or disciplining, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten or discipline? This is a part of what God's called us to do. Not just to see the kid grow up and get out of the house, but be able to grow up and love the Lord and have with him the stability that no matter where he goes on the face of the earth, he never is going to be on his own because God is with him. There is a responsibility that we as parents and grandparents have. And we need to understand it. This is serious. We are living in a day and age where we see many young people that are growing up and going their own way. And it's devastating. We are seeing people making wrong choice after wrong choice. And then as they think about God, they feel like they're not worthy. And the enemy is at work and he's sowing hopelessness. In contrast to that, the Word of God gives hope. It says that as you turn to him, as you trust Christ, he is your heavenly father. And he loves you. And he is interested in your development to become that godly man, that godly woman that he wants you to be. Get your eyes off of yourself and your wants that could destroy you and get your eyes back on your heavenly father and his plans and goals for your life. Where are you going to learn that? Now, you could say Payless Bible Church, and that wouldn't be a wrong answer, by the way, but that's not what I'm trying to say here today. It's in the Scriptures. It's in the Word of God. As we get into the book, we learn what God has for us. Oh, why in 2016 is the theme of this church read and pray? Because it's fundamental to your life. It's fundamental to the stability of your families. And it's fundamental to your ability to influence others. Because the greatest teaching tool that you will ever have is called example. If you're not doing it, what are you looking to try to influence somebody else for? The whole idea of dropping the kid off at church is not what we're looking for. It's that we bring our children to church. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's that we realize God has a call on all of us, and we don't want our children thinking, I've got to do this for this many years, and then when I get to be an adult, I don't have to do that anymore. Can I tell you something that happened? Some of you have heard this before. I have a son, Benjamin, daughter, Bethany. Love them both very much, and I'm very proud of who they are. But if there was something that took place in our home and something was damaged or destroyed or messed with, there was a culprit I tended to look to. I'm not going to give you his name, but the tendency was there. And one time something took place, something was damaged, and I immediately went to Ben and I disciplined him. And an hour and a half after that, I learned it wasn't him. If I took after my earthly father, I would say, I cannot humble myself before my kids or they will not respect me. But through the word of God, I learned that I need to be God's kind of man. And I went to my son and at the time, he was a lot shorter, so I, I had to get down on my knees before him. And I asked my son for forgiveness because I had disciplined him wrongly. And it really burdened me to the extent that my son said, Dad, it's okay. <laughs> and he forgave me. And I want to tell you what I think. I never stood taller in his eyes than that moment. Fathers and mothers, we need to teach our children that we need God too. You with me? It's not just that those kids, yeah, they've got to do it. 
It's that we're still in process too. You do not help your children when you make them think you are perfect because nobody's perfect but Jesus. Back to our text because we're going to run out of time and this is a really fantastic portion of Scripture. He says, uh, verse 8, If you're without chastening, without disciplining, of which all are partakers, then you're illegitimate, not sons. If you are not being disciplined by the Lord, are you really a child of God? Are you not His? Because if you're His, you're going to go through disciplining because God loves you and He wants you to become more of the man, the woman, the teen that He wants you to be able to be. Verse 9, he says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Today is a day to honor. We learn in the Scriptures we are to honor our father and our mother, okay? And so it's appropriate that we would do that. Keep going. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they, speaking of our earthly parents, indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. And by the way, our parents are not perfect, but they did what they could. Maybe they're in process right now, but they're not perfect, but we are to respect them and honor them. But parents are finite, and sometimes we make mistakes. It is important, parents, that you acknowledge it because I want you to know as the kids grow up, they see it. And if you pretend that you didn't, you lose respect as time goes along. Our earthly parents did what they could the best as they saw. Some of us grew up in, in homes where it wasn't easy and it wasn't clear. And, 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 and you know what made it harder to understand who our Heavenly Father was? But I want you to hear this. No matter who you are, no matter what you grew up with, whether you had a good upbringing in a godly home or one that was not, no matter what your relationship with your earthly father, I want you to know this. You are loved intensely and intentionally by our Heavenly Father. He loves you. Get your eyes on him. And so this text, at least for today, goes on and says, verse 11, Now no chastening or discipline seems joyful for the present, but painful. And all of God's people said, Do you all know what that text is? Because I've had people that shouted this part, you know. It's hard. Discipline's not a fun thing for the person. And even if they end up saying, This hurts me more than it hurts you, you go, Uh Uh-huh, I hear you say that, but I'm the one that's getting the discipline right here, you see? But the point of it is that there is no disciplining or chastening. It seems joyful for the present, but painful. Listen to this. Nevertheless, this is godly discipline out of love. This is what God calls earthly parents to do, and it is what our Heavenly Father is looking to be able to do in His children. He says, even though it may seem not joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God has a plan and a goal. And as much as you want just to feel good and have a smooth life and have no trials or difficulties, that is not your Heavenly Father's goal for you. His is much higher than yours. It is that you would grow to be able to bow the knee humbly before your God, and as a result, to find a stability in your life, no matter how unstable the world is around you. Is that good? Is that, is that good news? Are you hearing it? Because this is what God wants us to embrace. If you're a, a father, if you're a man and you're going to grow up, You need to recognize, I need God in the center of my life. There will be no stability, no matter how much other stuff I have, unless He is in the center of my life. Does He want to be? Oh, yes. Does He love me? Overwhelmingly. The cross is a clear evidence of it. And you know where where right now Jesus Christ is at? The right hand of the Father interceding for who? For you and for me. Are we loved by God? Yes, we are. Does God sometimes bring discipline into our life? Sometimes it is corrective discipline because we've gotten out of, off the path, and sometimes it's developmental discipline to cause us to be more of the man, the woman that God wants us to be. Either way, 
It's always out of, help me here, complete the sentence. It's out of love. My God, the God of the Bible, loves you. He does not punish his own. There will be a punishment one day on those who turn their back on God and try to live their life on their own. And one day they'll be separated from God for all eternity. They will pay for their sins on their own. But they don't have to. You don't have to. Because Jesus Christ came and loved you so much, he took everything you deserved. The family in God's plan was to be a microcosm of God's will in your life. I know it's not always. Just like back in Deuteronomy, it hadn't been. And that's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness, because they didn't get it, and they didn't trust him, and there was consequences as a result. But God is saying to you today, I love you. If you've never come and trusted my son, Jesus Christ, today is that day. If you have come to the place of saying, I knew I needed a Savior, and he he forgave me, I know that he did, I want you to know God wants to give you a greater blessing, and that is his presence with you on a daily basis, no matter what. To honor him, to please him, to walk with him in obedience. Seeing they were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You are loved. Today on this Father's Day, if you have an earthly father, honor him. If you've had a godly father, would you bless and affirm him and let him know that he has helped you to understand more about our Heavenly Father. And even if you didn't have that, or if your Father has come and He has gone and you find that you feel like He's not there, you have a Heavenly Father, not one person in this room that cannot look to Almighty God and know that you are loved. And God's people said, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for all that you give us. Father, we we look at two brief portions of your word in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 12. And though it's only a couple of verses, it says so much. Help us, Lord. Help us not simply to hear it. Help us, Lord, to not fall to that sense of critiquing the communicator. Oh, God, may we move way past me and understand the truth of the words themselves. And may our eyes be on you. Encourage, strengthen us, help us, Father, to take those steps of obedience, looking to you, walking as you would have us to walk, trusting you, and living in an attitude of humility. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.